from Research Wales, Bill. This is our eighth evidence session. And uh, we're joined uh, today um, by our witnesses for this session, which is uh, David Notley, who's co-chair of Innovation Advisory Council for Wales, Professor Howell Thomas, president of the Learned Society, and Professor Helen Fulton, vice president for Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences, the Learned Society. You're all very welcome. Um, just to say that uh, members will be um, asking you questions um, unless questions are directed at a specific organisation. I'll seek responses, first of all, from the Learned Society and then followed by David Notley. So um, I'll start with question, first question. Can you set out the main benefits of conducting research and innovation and why a public body should fund this activity? Thank, thank you, Chair. I'd just like to say, first of all, if I may, pleased we are to be here, how grateful we are for the opportunity to, to give evidence to the, to the committee. Um, and I suppose in a way, I can start by saying um, that all the dreadful things that are happening to us at the moment, you know, to do with COVID and all the potential worries we have about climate change, um, in some ways make, make make it easy for me to answer that question because uh, I think it's probably clearer today to most people how important science research is. You know, you only have to think, obviously stating the obvious, we probably got the outcome of long-term research um, actually literally flowing through our own veins, so to speak, having had the, having all the vaccinations. And um, so that, that's a very acute case, obviously. Um, but it is a very important case to show how important research and innovation is. The climate change agenda is important in Wales, as in all other places, and that's another really, really critical area where I think research and innovation has already delivered and will continue to need to deliver. Here in Wales, we have a challenge, particular challenge to do industrial decarbonisation, which that area requires research and innovation, I think, in order to address that problem and solve that problem. So I hope that's a kind of a quick flavour of the importance of the area, shall we say. Um, and then uh, the second part of your question about the public side and the public money. I mean, in terms of the bill itself, um, I guess it's quite important for me to highlight that, you know, the research support that would be provided is part of a dual a dual funding system dual support system where the uh, the university sector you know uh, receives money from the welsh government as one leg of that and then also bids into ukri for funding um and so a, a key reason I, I would suggest that you know it's important here in Wales to maintain that funding is related to that to, so that our our HE sector is kind of fighting fit if I can use that phrase to to compete for um, what is a much bigger pot of funding in UKRI and has been increased quite substantially in the last budget so I th the fundamental answer though I suppose to your question chair is that it's it's good value for money and you know the 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 that we as a community as a society gain the sort of benefits that i talked about before from investing in you know public money in research i hope that helps address your question yes, thank you very much uh, david did you want to come back on that yeah absolutely so uh, good uh, morning everybody and thank you for the opportunity to uh, to give evidence here um, I, I feel like I need to give a little bit of context as well, because some of the things that I'm going to be saying are really, you know, uh, influenced by that context. So, you know, my, my background is probably different to, to, to others that you're consulting with. So uh, I I've worked in venture capital. I've, I've built and exited from businesses. Um, I'm involved in you know, a range of early stage technology companies and, and raising funding and so on. And they're, and they're globally sort of focused technology companies. I'm also obviously co-chair of the Innovation Advisory Council for Wales. But what I think is really important to emphasize is that IACU 
is concerned with innovation in all its forms. Um, you know, and how can Wales harness innovation as a tool for change and for addressing the grand challenges that Wales faces? And I said in my sort of written evidence beforehand that uh, as uh, a council, as an advisory body to Welsh Government, we have a perspective which is that innovation exists in a spectrum. So absolutely it's about science and research and that is fundamentally important and uh, needs to be properly funded. But it's also about the other end of the spectrum, which is, you know, continuous improvement, digital transformation, et cetera. And that impacts, you know, uh, uh, across the public sector, the third sector and across society as a whole. Um, so I will be constantly referencing um, factors which are about innovation in its broadest sense and not just research. And I will also be talking about how we translate research into impacts on, on the, that, that kind of broadest uh, range of innovation. So to answer the question specifically, history is littered with evidence that the public sector and government is a crucial tool in seeding uh, innovation. You know, and uh, that doesn't matter whether um, you know, what, what political spectrum you're on or what kind of economy you have, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's a demonstrable fact that public sector funding helps to seed early stage uh, innovation and helps to change things. And I think if Wales wants to move the dial, if you like, on so many of the grand challenges that we have, we need government to lead the way. And uh, as Hal said, it is fundamentally really good value for money. And if we want to, to know the, the um, challenges that we face, if we look at almost every measure of innovation, Wales is at the bottom of every league table and we need to change that. And the, and the public sector and government has a crucial role in, in, in changing that. Well, thank you. And, um moves us on to what extent you believe legislation is necessary to achieve the policy objectives that um, this bill is intended to work towards and are those policy objectives clear to you? I go first again? Jen? Yeah. Yes, Paul? So I, I guess my understanding is of you know the background to the bill you know the objectives were to you know for tertiary education in general I, take this opportunity to say that the Learner Society supports the bill, supports the introduction of the bill, and is, generally speaking, in totally content with the direction of travel and with the, the plans and so on. And in general, the policy objectives seem to us to be clear, and we, you know, we sort of probably would echo a lot of the, a lot of the evidence given to you this time last week, I think it also maybe a little earlier this, than this time last week, by... University of Wales and the Open University, we, we're probably singing from a similar hymn sheet. We are interested as a learner society in the whole spectrum of the range of interests of the bill, as you'd expect. We're interested in education. It's of primary importance to us as a country, we believe, stating again, probably the obvious. Um, but our, our work is probably in the range of all the things that the bill covers. Our, our work and our interests are probably most closely aligned to the research and innovation agenda. And while we do absolutely acknowledge research is covered, you know, in the strategic objectives and so on, you know, if if we had probably request number one to to, to make and to kind of, you know, deliver to you on a day like today, it would be that may be that there would be a particular strategic objective related to research and that would be um, we, we make that request as gently as we possibly can but that that is our that is our view chair thank you how we've certainly heard that um david so, so again yes i think in, in in broad scope um I mean, I can't speak for IACU uh, as, as a whole, but speaking personally, um, I, I, I concur with the broad objectives of the legislation. However, I don't think there's sufficient um, emphasis on translational research. 
and the link between higher education, um, higher education activities, research activities, and the broader mission orientated challenges, if you like, that we face as a country. And I, and I think that could be strengthened. Um, and I think, I think we could set out in the legislation requirements to ensure that um, uh, that, that sort of transitional research has an impact on, on wider society and the economy and public services and so on. Uh, concerns have been raised with us regarding the information sharing provisions um, in the bill. Um, do you think they could inhibit information sharing with the Commission, particularly for research and innovation collaboration? How? Um, I, there may be an issue in, in the heart of that, I, you know, I suspect, but you know, uh, the, the answer to that is the Commission will need to be flexible to share data with organisations would be our response and our thinking along the in relation to that but you know that uh, as i guess as it, with anything at this kind of level there will be nuances and there will be details that will need you know development and refinement as 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 thinking continues should we say thank you david i don't have any major concerns in this area i mean i think i think you know these things can often be sort of set up to be challenges but in reality on the ground when one is working you know with with the realities that one faces um you know provided people are prepared to be pragmatic and consensual about what they're doing then i can't i can't really see that there should be a significant issue here um sometimes i think there's a danger that people will hide behind legislation as an excuse for not doing things and we've always got to be wary of that but I think if people are purpose orientated and prepared to be pragmatic and work within the the, the the structures they've been given then it shouldn't necessarily cause a problem. Thank you. Um, what I mean we've touched on this a little bit but what are the key policy issues in Wales in relation to research and innovation and do you think the, the bill addresses those um, and what is the evidence that it will deliver benefits for research and innovation activity? Perhaps I could, uh, yes, thank you. I'll address that question. Um, obviously research and innovation in Wales is hugely wide ranging and is already very flex flexible, very adaptable, very responsive to key policy areas in Wales. So clearly issues such as post pandemic recovery, climate change, um, delivering on the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act are clear priority areas for research and innovation in Wales at the moment. And these are already being addressed right across the spectrum of disciplines, not just the STEM subjects, science, technology, engineering, maths and medicine, but also the HAS disciplines, humanities, arts and social sciences are all contributing to these policy areas. In terms of the evidence of the benefits of this legislation in terms of supporting research and innovation, I suppose um, the, the, the most important thing to come out of it will be to keep teaching and research together. And at the Learned Society, we believe that that's a really important objective to, um, to have teaching and research as part of the same um, enterprise in higher education. And I think the Commission um, should be able to better facilitate those kinds of collaborations between uh, further education and higher, in it, higher education, which will have a very important role in helping us to promote why research matters. Thank you. Helen, David. <laughs> so as I've already sort of outlined really, I, I think that um, there's more that can be done to uh, ensure better translational research, better engagement between higher education research and the wider challenges that the economy society faces. Um, and, and that I think is a question of building on what we've got. You know, it's not a question of um, you know, criticizing anything that currently exists, but I think it's a question of saying, right, okay, how can we actually improve the way in which higher education research collaborates with wider uh, economy and society and makes it makes a, a direct and measured 
impact on some of the grand challenges we face. Um, and, and, and sometimes, you know, and I, I'm a big fan of, of, of sort of a lot of activity in, in, in universities and higher education and further education, actually, you know, around things like, you know, um, agile and lean, you know, things that relate to SMEs and so on. But I, I, I don't think that research is getting to the people that it needs to get to. So um, if we have a, 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 a range of challenges we're trying to face, and I'll give some examples. So how do we improve productivity in SMEs? You know, the, the, the higher education and further education sectors have a massive role to play in that, but I don't think that is being played at, at the level it could be at the moment. How do we drive digital transformation in public services? Again, there's a role there, but I'm not sure it's, it's, it's happening to the extent that it could. How, for example, could we harness the third sector to impact environmental challenges? Because the third sector can definitely do that. Um, again, I think there's a role for higher and further education in that. But I'm not sure that's actually happening. Um, and, and, and there are all sorts of sort of other sort of slightly um, unconventional things. So, for example, how do we harness the sports infrastructure in, in, in Wales to impact health and well-being, you know, and, and the higher and further education sectors have a lot to say about sport, for example, and th they're, they're very active in those areas, if that's not a pun. Um, but, but, but how do we actually, you know, a, 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 and indeed, you know, Wales has world-class sports capabilities, sports research, etc. but I don't feel at the moment that there's the necessary impetus to translate what the higher ed and further education sectors can, are doing in that space to actually, for example, impact on people's health and well-being. I think we can do more, and, and I think the legislation can mandate that. Thank you. Um, the bill's documentation sets out that the potential implementation costs for other bodies is unknown. Is there likely to be a cost impact on organisations that conduct R&D? Um, perhaps I could take that one. Um, okay. We don't anticipate any costs to um, HE institutions. Um, we, we assume that, that funding won't be diverted from existing research budgets to establish and set up the commission. Obviously, the cost of implementation will be considerable, but we would expect that money not come from existing research budgets. So we don't see a problem with the cost of setting up the commission. David? I have to confess, this is not an area that I know a huge amount about, so I'm not going to pass comment. <laughs> um, I, I, I mean, I, I think it seems to me from the outside, I, mean, I work with universities a lot, that. Um, you know, uh, th there ought to, on the face of it, be capacity to ensure that there's not, you know, a challenge in that area. Thank you. Um, the ministers told us, um, told the committee in on the 19th of November that he intends for the commission to be set up in 2023 and uh, operational in 2024-25. Uh, can you tell us about any concerns that you have regarding the timings and process of physically establishing the commission and setting up all the regulatory machinery, for example? Helen? Um, we don't see any immediate problems. Obviously, some kind of staged implementation or introduction or, you know, changing to a new system um, would be welcomed. I suppose the only slight uh, hesitation would be over the timing of the next REF, the, the Research Excellence Framework, and whether the transition is going to interfere with universities' preparations for the next REF. But that would be our only concern, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Can I can yes, I chip in as well? Yeah. So uh, I guess it may be something that we, we can return to during the course of this session, but um, I've already mentioned the dual support system for the universities and the fact that, you know, that they, they need to seek funding from, from UK sources. Um, and I, I think it, it's kind of important to, right now, I think, to be mindful of the fact that there are no less than four reviews taking place at the moment initiated by the by the Westminster government of this sector and this landscape. And so I suppose the point I'm trying to make is that I think it, it's 
there's never a great time to to, to introduce changes there as, as as helen said but um i do think it's it, it very important to keep an eye on those uk-wide changes those reviews and the things they might suggest um in the totality of, of what we're talking about david well it's a fast-moving environment isn't it you know, there's all, all, all sorts of stuff going on. I mean, I would absolutely agree with that. I mean, I, I think, you know, the, you know, one of the big issues is um, when are we going to get certainty from Westminster about, about funding in this space, about other things like the Shared Prosperity Fund, uh, Community Renewal Funds and so on, you know, so that, that, that's a really big issue. And um, I mean, for me, the, the, the timeline 2023 doesn't sort of ring any alarm bells. I think the most important thing is to get it right and, and not sort of uh, uh, provide for artificial timeframes or deadlines, but, but, but to get it right. What I would observe is that, um, as, as you're probably all aware, the Welsh Government is undertaking a fundamental review of innovation policy now across the whole of government. And it seems to me that this um area of activity needs to needs to feed into that as well um so i, I to answer the question 2023 i, I don't think that's a, a big deal in itself what is more important is to make sure that we coordinate all of the moving parts and we and we get things right and build a platform that we can that we can actually scale effectively Thank you, David. Uh, we'll now um, go to some uh, Laura and Jones for some questions from Laura. Laura. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the bill seems to limit the Commission to not only being able to uh, to only being able to provide R and I uh, to funding to registered providers, and this in turn would seem to limit R and I funding to only universities. Um, there is some concern that FE colleges and um, and those bodies who can access UK level public. Uh, research and innovation funding would not be able to receive commission funding as they would not be registered. Uh, the statement of policy intent does not signal any intent to create a category of registration for RNI. Um, in England, a much wider um, uh, range of institutional bodies can be funded by the UK RI to conduct RNI. What is your view on this and, and what does it mean for non-university RNI activity? Thank you. Well, I think there are other sources of funding for non-HE um, institutions, such as further education colleges, um, uh, uh, you know, who can apply for other sources of funding. So I think it's, it's right that um, the Commission is focusing on universities. Um, it is, after all, an education and research bill, and research is, is what is done by universities. So I don't think that there would be a huge impact on research and innovation activity outside of higher education. Um, I think the important thing is that we leave the way open to collaborations with institutions of all kinds outside higher education, not just further education, but also the major institutions of Wales, like the National Library, the National Museum, the Royal Commission, um, and so on and that we, we have the opportunity to develop networks and opportunities to build collaborations between universities, bodies outside HE, business, of course, um, because this is a model of success in capturing research and development funding um, from other bodies. So we don't see a problem in that area. Thank you. David? So I, I'm perhaps not unexpectedly, I'm going to take a different view there. Um, I, I think this is a problem. Um, and, and it's not a problem because uh, in, in, in a sort of um, narrow sense, um, it, it, it's a problem because does it encourage collaboration? Does, does it indeed maybe mandate collaboration? Does it facilitate collaboration? And, you know, I think for myself and speaking for the Innovation Advisory Council, you know, there are real dangers in um, funding being siloed in particular directions or particular areas. 
and um, I, I'm quite content for for the funding to be root, rooted, if you like, through uh, the education sector because this is specifically about research. I understand that. However, if there is mechanism that facilitates, encourages, possibly even mandates collaboration, I think that would be a positive thing. And I think I think there is opportunity to uh, allow for pull, uh, i.e. for organisations outside the HE and FE sector to pull research out of those institutions. You know, so, so, so to make that practical, why would it not be possible to get a small group of, you know, industry or public sector together and approach a university and say, why don't we put a bid together for, for X, Y, or Z, because this would be to our benefit. And the, and the university would benefit as well and so on. But if, if you've got a, a set of circumstances and mechanisms that allow for that, um, then, then I think that's positive. And the danger is the opposite, is that if the, if the funding is rooted to the universities, to, to the FE sector, then it's incumbent on them to reach out should they choose to do so. And, and that might not always be the case. Okay, thank you. Laura? Okay, thank you. Uh, the Commission will seemingly have no role or duty um, with regards to research and innovation activity and funding that currently occurs outside the higher education sector. Um, what is your view on that? Helen or Harold? Um, well, we, we reckon, you know, I recognise the points that David make, and we reckon, and personally, and I and and, and I recognise some of those issues. I, I uh, and so I don't, don't want to be dismissive of David's and you know the Innovation Council's worries. I'm, I'm just not quite convinced. I suppose that this bill and this mechanism is the way to address those. You know, there are things happening, as I'm sure you know, David, out there in the skills sector, you know, HE and FE are working together and regional skills and so on. And, and I mentioned climate change, you know, a little bit earlier. So I, I kind of maybe just 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 shares a few thoughts that, that, you know, maybe it's not quite as, as black and white as as it might be appearing. Um, but we still maintain the view in the Learned Society, as expressed by Helen, really, that, you know, as far as the, this bill is concerned, and as far as the, the you know, the, the kind of, you know, the funding that is talked about here in this bill, it is extremely important for us that that is seen within the dual support system. You know, the, the, the amount of money that's now been available, been made available to UKRI from the last budget, is going up to 20 billion pounds. And I'll just I'll stop for a moment on that figure. That's a colossal amount of money that's been made available for research and innovation. And I think, you know, what is really, really important, I think, is that the Welsh universities, as part of this dual support system, it, you know, are strong and fit and agile to compete with the other UK universities for that pot of money and to bring that back to Wales. And, you know, within that pot of money, there is a significant sum of money for Innovate UK, which is specifically for innovation. So just make the general point without disagreeing at all with the points that David are making. I'm very well aware of some of the people that David works with. In fact, Rick Delbridge is a special advisor to the president of the Learning Society of Wales, i.e. myself. So, you know, we've many things in common. Um, but, uh, you know, the route that we would see that would be the best way forward on this is related more to, to the points that I've just made. David? So, um, absolutely, I don't, I don't disagree, you know, that there is lots of activity. Um, there are many things that we can point out which are good practice, best practice, occasionally world-class practice. But the challenge that we have is that, well, A, there's not enough of it. Um, and I think, I think we all kind of understand that. But B, so much of what happens, happens in silos. So my question would be, why lose the opportunity with this bill 
to build on collaborative frameworks and to facilitate that um, and to provide for mechanisms that allow that to happen. Um, you know, and um, Howell has uh, referenced Rick Delbridge. So Rick was one of the authors of um, a report on innovation in Wales that we commissioned from Cardiff University. Um, I, I did submit that as part of my, my, my evidence beforehand. And I, I would uh, uh, highly recommend that both the Cardiff University reports and the Amplify reports are, are considered because there's lots of really good recommendations there about how we get, um, you know, innovation, the flywheel spinning in Wales, how we improve collaboration, how we avoid, avoid the siloing of activities and so on. So what, 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 I, what I would sort of say in conclusion is that I, I'm not, I'm not criticizing here. You know, I'm not sort of saying that, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not criticizing. I'm just saying we can get better at the collaborative piece and we, we can leverage a whole range of capabilities that we have in Wales. But if we allow research and innovation to become siloed, um, if, we, if we don't take the opportunities to build a broader ecosystem, then I think we're missing a trick. And um, I, I totally understand um, the points that are being made here. And, you know, I, I get the fact that, you know, um, you know, research is a globally competitive environment and Wales needs universities that can compete globally. And to do that, you need funding. I, I completely understand that. And we have some really good, as I said, world-class examples of that already in Wales. But we're not knitting everything together effectively. And I believe this is an opportunity to begin to address some of those uh, deficiencies. Absolutely, David, thank you for that. And final question to everybody following on from that, the Welsh Government has considered the option of establishing a separate body for fund, um, to fund research and innovation. Uh, in your view, what are the benefits and disbenefits of, of the Commission being responsible for both research and tertiary education? Thank you. Thank you. Well, you know, it is about choices, isn't it, you know, and there is an argument to be made for a, a separate body to fund more, you know, you know, as you say, uh, R and I separately, um, and one of the one of the reviews, the UK reviews that are now taking place, is about looking at this research landscape and the sort of infrastructure and as it fit for purpose for the challenges that we face going forward. Um, so we recognise that that these reasonable question, a fair a fair question, and it's a it's a matter of choice. Um, we and the Learning Society are pleased to see research as part of the education bill we we i personally come from a he sector and i've always found the linkage between education and research to be absolutely vital central to what we do um, i know there's a tendency today in some quarters and in some areas to maybe think of these things as a little bit more separately but you know the people that do this in the universities it's kind of there's one person that does it he, that person does the teaching and does the research and this linkage through is is right at the core really of all of my experience um, of how the research environment grows and develops the students come in to the universities and you know exposed to the research environment and 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 so so generally speaking um, we are pleased that that is the situation is continuing um, and I think that, you know, th but we do recognize that there, there was a ch the choice that could have been made. Thank you. So I think this is a tricky one, really. I mean, I, I, at the end of the day, this, it, it, it's got to be about outcomes, hasn't it? You know, what, what's the, what are we going to, where, where do we get the best bang for buck, so to speak? You know, how do we have the most impact? How do we create innovation? Uh, research, science, ecosystems that are wholly connected to one another. I know I'm painting a slight nirvana here, but you know, for the for the purposes of illustration, I think it's um, it's probably allowed. 
um, you know, how, how do we ensure that? And I think we have a very real opportunity in Wales to do that because we have a compact country, we have, um, we have you know, natural linkages, if you like. And my worry, my worry is that we take an approach which encourages and um, solidifies the siloing of research and innovation. And I think that's just a bad idea. And, and I think anything that we can do to ensure cross-cutting collaboration ha has to be a positive. So I don't know whether I've answered your question, um, but my, my feeling personally is that there are dangers in associating uh, uh, the source of the funding directly in, into the higher education sector. Thank you. Thanks, David. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you, Laura. Uh, moving on to some questions now from James Evans. Thank you, Chair. I, I want to talk about research and innovation, the duty and the funding. The Commission will have a strategic duty to promote continuous improvement and collab collaboration and coherence with regard to research and innovation. So what are your views on this approach and the relevant duties that are set out in the bill? And it's to everybody. Helen? Do you want me to take this, Helen? Oh. Um, well, I mean, I think this is one of the, you know, kind of linked to the last question as well, isn't it? Is, you know, if you have research with the education side, then you have this continuous kind of spectrum from the teaching into, into the research agenda. Um, anybody who, you know, isn't supportive of promoting a continuous improvement in the quality of education and training, I mean, I, I, I don't suppose you'll have had any witnesses tell you that they, they disagreed with that. I mean, that, that is obviously an, a thoroughly welcome and appropriate um, way forward. Um, so, you know, we're completely supportive of all of that. Um, we think that, you know, the Commission will need to consider again looking a little bit outside Wales as a UK government's people and culture strategy for R&D that is developing that, you know, um, we think is important um, to, to, and that researchers within HE in Wales would not be disadvantaged in any way. Um, and it, again, um, maybe the new, the Welsh government's new innovation strategy will play into, in, into this agenda as well. So, um, yeah, so I, I hope that answers your question, James. That, that, that Those are our thoughts on the matter. Yeah, thank you. Um, another question I've got, the Commission will have the regard to the tertiary education workforce and its requirement for professional development, but not in relation to research and innovation workforce. You know, what are your views on researchers not being included? David, did you want to come back on that and anything from the, the other question? Sorry, the second question or the first question? Um, if you've got anything on the first question. So I'm the first sure question very quickly. Can... So, I mean, I think you can tell from, from the sort of themes that I'm exploring here, my, my view would be that it doesn't go far enough um, and, and, and that there are opportunities to ensure better uh, collaboration with third party, third parties generally, wherever they might reside. Um, the second question, I, I mean, I don't, I, to be honest with you, again, I don't think I'm really in a position to, to, to make a, a, a significant uh, contribution here, but it does seem to me to be rather odd that, um, that, that there wouldn't be provisions for, for, you know, continuous professional development, continuous improvement, et cetera, et cetera, in, 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 in the research, um, yeah, in the in the research research infrastructure. Yeah, but well, why why would you not do that? I don't know. Hello, Helen. So okay. obviously, this is an area that is you know, if, if you if you knew about the things we're doing at all in the Learning Society, even though this is an area close to our heart, really, we actually set up um, and we, we've recently received funding from from Hefco to set up an um, 
a network of uh, early career researchers in Wales. And the, the, the thrust of everything that we do really is an all, on an all Wales basis is to support our early career researchers. We, we think that's really, really important, um, you know, for, for, for obvious reasons, I guess. And, and the all Wales approach is proving very, very successful. So you know, we're certainly in favour of the, uh, you know, continual develop, professional development of the our early career researchers. It's been an issue in the higher education sector for for some years, I think it'd be fair to say that, you know, um, that that's something that needs close attention. Um, in terms of your specific question of why it's in the bill or not, I'm not sure I'm well placed to answer that really, but I, I think it's certainly a subject that, that is already getting a lot of close attention. James? Yeah, that's fine, thank you. I want to move on to funding now, if that's okay. So section 104 of the bill says, says that the commission must set out and report on the extent to which research and innovation activities it funds are achieving successful results. You know, do you think this is a helpful approach considering the nature of research innovation and what you do? I like how you're smiling at that one. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, it's it, it's a good question, James. That's the first thing I'd say to you. You know, um, it, it, you know when, when you put money into research. Um, you obviously want value for money, you know. I mean, I, you know, I wouldn't expect any politician to say otherwise. You know, it, it stands to reason, doesn't it? Um, but there's there's a kind of fundamental difference about research to maybe some of the other areas that that the government would fund is that you know if you are doing honestly, truly, the full range of speculative research, you can and should expect that some of those occasionally to fail you know and, and it's a bit like venture capitalism and and company creation so it's not it's not a waste of money when some 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 areas are a bit of a dead end but but it, it is really quite a quite a difficult balance to answer in a question you know is that you obviously don't you you, you want success from the research and innovation money and i you know I, you know, if I was sitting in your shoes, I would probably be asking the question, you know, as, as we ask ourselves, you know, what every pound you put into R&I, you could be putting into other pressing areas of importance. So it's a very, very real and fair question. I, I, I think it needs this kind of nuanced approach in, in looking at it. I don't think a direct relationship with success is absolutely the right one. Um, and the other point to make is that some, sometimes the success is very time delayed as well. You know that you know you 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 may not have, you may have been funding. If I can use the example of the pandemic, you may have been funding research in the pandemic area for for quite a long time, as I think has happened, and probably many of us were not terribly conscious that, of the fact that a pandemic may actually come one day. But but you know look at the value for money that's come from that. So you know not not as my answer is that it's not a simple answer, James, I guess. So I, I hope that's helpful. Yeah, if I just come back really quickly on that, just following on a little bit, do you think it'll make the commission a bit risk averse going forward that they'll, they'll only sort of fund the low level, the low risk activities and actually the high risk activities, which could deliver, deliver big benefits, maybe won't get funded? I wouldn't put that so much in the commission's remit. I mean, I, I'll keep making the point, I'm sorry if I sound like a bit like a broken record this morning, but but for me, it's all about the dual support system. You know, there's the amount of money that the, that the, the commission will be getting when you contrast that with what is the upcoming UKRI budget after the after, after the budget, last budget spending review up, uplift is 20 billion pounds. And I think that's, you know, we we tend to think of the key of of you know the this 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 basic support, the core core support, if you like, as you know the foundations from which we can go forward and you know and bid for money to then do the more speculative research. And I think that's where the discussions need then to be to be taken about you know um, what the what the sort of acceptable kind of um, hit rate might be. I mean, I, I emphasize, you know, we're not talking about poor research here. We're talking about good quality research, but which simply didn't yield the promise that you thought it might do, you know, cold fusion or something like that, you know? So 
but some of that wasn't very good research as well. Uh, yeah, thank you, Harold. David, did you want to come in on those points? Uh, uh, yes, please. Uh, so, uh, uh, as you know, people know, work in industry and, and other sectors, you know, it's it's hard to manage something which you don't measure. Um, so me measurement is is key key to to any kind of effective uh, management system, really. But but uh, as Hal was implying there, it gets more complicated than that because then the question becomes, what do you actually measure? Um, and uh, I, I, I think obviously there are different types of research, there are different levels of research, and you know everybody here will be familiar with the concept of technology readiness levels from zero to nine and, and 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 so on you know and if you're doing something at zero it, it can be much harder to measure that you know whereas if you're doing something at six or seven then it should be much easier to measure that so to try and sort of make that real um you know if you're in the higher education sector and you're in a business department and you're doing research on agile uh, manufacturing techniques, then, you know, there ought to be some measures in there as to how that then impacts, you know, SMEs and local businesses and, 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 and things like that. If you're doing TRL stuff z at zero on drug discovery, then it's, it's a much tougher thing to do. So I, th I think, you know, I, mean, I agree with Hal, it, 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 it's, there is a nuance here but that's not an excuse not to measure anything. Um, but if you are going to measure something, make sure you choose what you're measuring carefully and intelligently. Thank you. James, do you have any other yeah, questions? Yeah, one last question from me to the last one, funding. Yeah. The reduction of core grant funding for research and innovation has been a concern for higher education sector for some time so what do you think this bill will mean for the core grant funding for research and that's the final question from me Jeff. perhaps i could take that one first of all i'm sure her will have things to say as well um i think the point we want to make is that the qr funding or the core funding is really the basis of funding research in higher education it's absolutely vital that we preserve that um, and direct it where it should be directed into both basic and mission-led, um, challenge-led research in universities. Um, we, we currently get about £80 million through the, the QR funding, which is a relatively small amount, as Howell said, compared to the kind of sums that can be awarded to UKRI. And the QR funding that currently goes to universities on the basis of their performance in the REF, the Research Excellence Framework, um, really um, helps universities to then apply for other kinds of support funding through UKRI, through EU funding and so on. So that's the dual support mechanism, QR funding on the one hand, and then applying for external grant funding on the other hand. QR funding is absolutely crucial to the research that, that universities do. And perhaps one unintended consequence of the creation of a commission could be that the existing emphasis on and recognition of the importance of QR funding as outlined in the Diamond and Reed reviews, that that importance could be somewhat diluted um, through, through what the Commission is proposing. Um, but the QR fund really must be protected in line with the recommendation of the reviews and perhaps even increased in order to support more mission-led and challenge-based research um, even supporting things like the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act and so on, other kinds of Welsh priorities actually need additional targeted funding if we're to achieve some of those ambitions. So I think it's important that QR um, is recognised as really the basic building block of what goes on in terms of research and innovation in universities right across all subjects, both STEM and HAS and it supports both basic research and mission-led research. I realise Howell might want to come back in, but can you, we, I'm just conscious of time, Howell, so if yeah. you could be brief. Absolutely, Chair. Um, final point I wanted to make that 80 million pound is a small quantum of funding within the Commission's budget. 
And our second take home message really would be a request for balanced funding arrangement is needed to ensure that research funding is, is protected. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Harold. David, Got anything briefly to say on this? Well, 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 yes, very briefly. I mean, again, I'm not sure I'm I'm necessarily qualified to 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 answer particularly here, but 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 to observe, you know, um, should we allow a situation to develop where funding for basic research is cut? Well, no. Why why would we do that? Um, I, I think what I would say is um, uh, that, that we have to be equally cognizant of, you know, some of the other aspects that, that need funding as well, which is, you know, more mission oriented research, you know, addressing challenges, translational research and so on. So I, I don't think anything that I'm saying here argues that we should be taking money from one, one area and put it in another area. Uh, what I'm arguing for is a, a more intelligent and joined up way of ensuring that we pull together all of the moving parts of our innovation ecosystem and don't just see research on its own. Thank you, David. I'm going to move on now to questions from Sean Ed Williams. Sean Ed. Thank you. Chair, I have a few questions with regard to the influence of the Welsh Government. To what extent are you content with the arrangement in the Bill with regard to establishing the research and innovation? Um, I'm, I'm not sure if it just happened to me, but I think the translation might have... Yeah, that happened to me as well. Yeah. Yeah, it was, we... it was jumpy. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Sean, Ed, the, the translation cut out. Okay, just to read my Gany couple of questions. So, just to restate, is everything working now? Yes. Better, yeah. So, these are questions with regard to Welsh Government influence. So, to what extent are you content with the arrangements in the Bill with regard to establishing the Research and Innovation Committee and appointing the Chair? Hello, Helen. Right, take that, Helen. Do you have any question, Sean Ed? Um, Thank you very much for the question, Sean Ed. Perhaps I'll try to answer in English. I'm not sure whether my Welsh is good enough to do everything in Welsh. Apologies for that. With those arrangements, with the amendments made since the draft, so we are, we 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 we're not concerned about that after that. So we we we, we, we we're grateful for those amendments. Anything from you, David? Uh, um, not really. I don't have a particular view on that other than to obviously emphasise again that we need to ensure that innovation is seen in its broadest context and that wherever it's been taken place, it's, you know, in collaboration with others. Thank you very much. Now, Welsh ministers can issue directions to the Commission and change its strategic plan. We've touched on this already. So what are the implications, in your view, of this, if at all, in terms of research and innovation activity? And is there an, an intended risk, perhaps, that it exposes the Commission or research and innovation in Wales open to political influence? Do you have a question? Well, once again, thank you for the question. Obviously aware of the points that you're making, Sean, and you know, we, we have we have considered that that question. Um, I, I think at the end of the day, this is going to come down to you know the practicalities of how things work. I, mean, I, I could envisage an occasion happening where you know th there may be such a pressing need for research in a particular area in Wales that that you know I, I couldn't say that the provision was unreasonable, you know, but, but I think from from where we're sitting, this is very much you know the devil in the details, so to speak, and it is how it would be applied, and we can all imagine. Uh, I dare say unreasonable situations occurring where you know, but but I I, I can't I can't see that as a real issue, frankly, uh, as we sit here today. Everything that I've seen and heard is very much about a consultative consultative approach and so on. And so we are not we 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 we're, we're not overly concerned about that aspect. Right? So I put it like that. David. So, yeah, I think I would agree with that assessment. I mean, I think, you know, the reality is, is politics is everywhere, isn't it? You know, I mean, obviously, one would have a concern if if there was sort of short term, you know, uh, political in interference, if you like, for, for a specific 
you know, short term goal or requirement, but I, I don't think it's unreasonable that the Welsh government should be in a position to be able to set the strategic direction of, of, of this body. So, you know, I, 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 th I think it's it, it's just something that that has to be in a sense. Um, I, I wouldn't have major concerns. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, because I, I, I think, yeah. I, just really wait, but I'm, I'm, I'm I was just going to say that the, the next question I have is related to that, and perhaps you've already answered that now. Do you feel that the Haldane principle is sufficiently apparent on the face of the bill, and is it appropriate for it to be? The, well, you know, do you have a question? Well, once again, thank you for the question. I'll answer in English. It's very similar to that used to define the Haldane principle in the Higher Education Research Act 2017. This is a welcome inclusion in the bill, although we would welcome specific reference to Haldane as it is, as is the case with other legislation. Um, we recognize the importance of the Haldane principle for sure. And, and you know, it, it's been, it's, it's served the, the university sector well for, you know, for many, many years. Um, we, we are also, um, and, and, you know, I could stop at that point, but, you know, just, just to also come back to the point of probably addressed earlier, you know, that we also do recognize that, you know, a certain amount of directed research is the nature of, of the day today, you know, and it would be hard to imagine, you know, and the circumstances say of the pandemic that, you know, that, that there wasn't a certain amount of direction about what research needed to be done, you know, but I think, again, it is a very, very much a matter of principle, a matter of, of, of how one does it, and the, the Holden principle remains an important principle for us. Do you want to add anything, Helen? Thanks, Howell. Yes, just to, just sorry, to, Helen. Sorry, just to reinforce what um, Howell said, that uh, we recognise that the Haldane principle is kind of implied in, in the Commission terms, but that it is a really important aspect of what we do and an important part of assuring at autonomy within um, institutions. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. David? So, I mean, I would agree with that. And I, I, and I, I think, I, I, again, I will, I will defer to people with, with much better knowledge in this space than, than me. But, you know, what I would observe is that, you know, these things are always trade-offs, aren't they? You know, it's a balance to strike. Um, uh, absolutely. Uh, institutions need to be autonomous, um, but at the same time, the, the people who are holding the purse strings need to be able to have control of strategic direction. And I suspect, as Howell has has, um, has, has noted there, it, it, it will be in the implementation where where those those trade offs and balances will actually manifest themselves. I'd like to go back to that question of. In institutional independence and perhaps uh, turn to academic freedom that's part of that. Do you believe that the bill adopts an appropriate approach to institutional autonomy? And if not, what should be changed? Because one thing that struck me, I have a husband who works in higher education and is a researcher. Should that autonomy and that ac academic freedom be on an individual level than on an institutional level in terms of R and I. How? Oh, what the hell? Can I please take a minute, Helen? Are you happy to take that, Helen? Helen. Yeah. Okay. Helen. I think some. I think something more could be done to. Um, emphasize the importance of academic freedom and autonomy in the bill. I think there is a, a risk that the bill will encourage um, a sort of greater control of what research is done in universities. And I think universities need to have the assurance that they can pursue the kind of research that they think is valuable, as well as tying in with, with government priorities. Um, much research already does follow government, government priorities. Much research is already done in collaboration with businesses, with organizations outside universities. 
the whole impact agenda has meant that our research has to be shown to have a positive impact in society generally. So we already do um, take into account uh, social and political um, and economic agendas. But I think to do basic research, that is very much researcher driven. That has to come from researchers themselves. And we have to make sure that the bill allows for basic research as well as for mission-led research. So even something like having the additional statutory duty to fund research and innovation would be a way of assuring that universities have the autonomy to pursue the research that they think is important. Thank you. Um, David, did you have anything briefly to ask them? We're very quickly running out of time. Yeah, 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 sure. I mean, again, you know, this is not my area of expertise, so so I hesitate to comment really. But I mean, I think my my observation would be that that not all research is the same, and that you know the the sorts of autonomy that you would allow in basic research may be different to to something that's a bit more you know a bit higher up the TRL level, if you like. So again, I think this is going to be a question of a balance to strike. I mean, I think autonomy is very important to higher education institutions for sure. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Um, we're just going to go now to some questions from Mike Hedges around, um, around collaboration, which we have touched on. But Mike? Thank you, Sorry, I, I could see you and hear you, but apparently you couldn't, hear, couldn't see me. Uh, really, my qu first question on collaboration, is the bill going to help collaboration, uh, especially with other organisations uh, which aren't covered by the bill, such as the, the role Mr. Uh, Mr. Notley carry, uh, covers. Hello, Helen. Helen? Yeah, I, I believe it will help collaboration, um, provided that uh, the QR funding goes to universities in order to support their research. As I've said, research in universities is already highly collaborative, and we, we can offer collaborations funded collaborations with external organisations if we have that money at our disposal. So I think the bill will help collaboration as long as um, the QR funding is, is, is directed towards universities. David? So, so, so again, I'm going to disagree with that. Um, so uh, I don't disagree with the sentiment, but I, I think there's potentially a missed opportunity here. I think there is a, a, an opportunity that, that that could go begging, which is to provide further mechanisms and framework to encourage and facilitate better collaboration between Welsh universities and the broader innovation ecosystem. And I, and I think the bill at the moment is a bit too narrow in its perspective on that. And, and it's potentially a missed opportunity. Oh, thank you. Mike, finally. Uh, the final question is, I mean, will the need to get consent from the Commission to pass on funds be a barrier to collaboration, particularly considering the level of collaboration involved in research and innovation, and also the amount of research and innovation which is then cross-border, and not just with England, but with other parts of Europe uh, uh, as well? Howell or Helen? Helen? Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah, um, I guess the answer to your question is this could be a barrier to effective collaboration. So transparent and efficient processes will be essential. And, and that's what we would advocate. Thank you, Howell. David? Yeah, I would agree with that. Wonderful. Oh, uh, thank you very much. That's the end of the um, evidence session. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. It was really helpful uh, to the committee. Um, you will receive a transcript in the coming weeks. Um, and uh, what just remains to be said, thank you very much again. Um, just thank to committee you. members.